My name's Tim Pringle. I'm chairing the panel. Each of our speakers, we've got four speakers, they will introduce themselves. Uh, we've got Darren Byler, Nisha Kapoor, Rahima Mahmoud and Maya Wong. Um, each speaker will speak for eight to ten, ten minutes and then we'll open it, open it up to the Q&A. So mostly a repeat of the previous session, except that we are going to finish at quarter past one. Because even though we don't give you lunch, we're going to give you three quarters an hour to think about that you haven't got any lunch, OK? <laughs> So, you can't say we're not generous. So that's what we're going to aim. So if you please, please do have contributions. The, the discussion was great in the last panel. We want to try and emulate that. Um, but keep, try and keep your contributions um, brief. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So we're, we're going to start off with Darren. And I think, Darren, you're going to come, you're going to come over here because you've got a PowerPoint presentation. So, uh, thank you and welcome to all the speakers. It's a, it's a real honor to be here, uh, and um, I'm Darren Byler, an anthropologist at the University of well, University of Col uh, Colorado at Boulder. Was at the University of Washington. I almost said that. Uh, just started a postdoc position there, looking at infrastructure in China. I study surveillance systems, uh, technology systems, um, both in China and as they move to other places. Um, and I also have another project that related to the Uyghur context. Um, where I'm looking at forced labor. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that in my presentation today, but if you, if you want, want to have a discussion about forced labor in China, I'm happy to do that too. Um, OK, so the, the title of my, my 10 minutes is Technologies for, uh, of For-Profit Colonialism making, and Making Lives Matter. In the summer of 2017, nearly all of the men in Sholpan Am Amarken's family were taken to re-education camps. Aside from Chopin's husband, it was just women who were left. Because her father-in-law was an imam in the local Kazakh community, her whole family was deemed unsafe or suspicious. In the months that followed, state workers who were tasked with carrying out the re-education of, of Muslim minorities in Xinjiang entered her home on a regular basis to inspect the remaining members of Chopin's family. They used a wide range of te technological tools to do this. For instance, they scanned her family members' bodies and their belongings with handheld metal, metal detectors, the kind an airport security worker might use. These devices were manufactured in Shenzhen by a technology firm called Dali, who had shipped, uh, who had shipped these, these uh, scanning devices to Xinjiang in mass quantities. A spokesperson for the company said in a joke, uh, in a speech, that, that only the bathrooms in Xinjiang were without surveillance. In fact, all, even the bathrooms in Uyghur and Kazakh homes uh, were not safe from the scans. Um, the police were looking for electronics, unreported smartphones, SD cards, hard drives, language learning devices, such as a Quran reciter that you see here. Um, it's a pen that you can scan over the text and it will tell you how to, how to learn the Quran. And many, many people had these in 2014 and 15 when I was doing my research. Um, these are the types of, of devices that they were looking for with their scanning, scanning equipment. According to the guidelines in the state issued, that the state issued to enforce the religious de-extremification policy, having five or more digital copies of unauthorized teachings resulted in a criminal charge of promoting terrorism and extremism. Possessing fewer than five could result instead in being labeled a pre-criminal in need of re-education in the internment camps. The police installed cameras at the front gate of Chopin's home, um, and they made visitors register their names and ID numbers. Chopin said, quote, our home became like a government office. Uh, the neighbors began to avoid Chopin's family. Chopin said that on numerous visits, the police plugged her smartphone into a scanning device that looked like this, um, that could recover deleted data in a matter of seconds. Although the AI system learned something more from about the patterns of her behavior each time they did this, she said it did not detect anything extremist. She said that she, there was reasons for this. It, it was, uh, since it was a, a non-Chinese iPhone, they couldn't find anything. If it was a Huawei phone, 
They could have. They asked me, why are you using this phone? They said I should, should have been patriotic and gotten a Chinese phone. I purposefully bought the iPhone from a Kazakh from Kazakhstan because I knew it was safer. Otherwise, I would have definitely been sent to the camp because before I cleaned my phone, cleaned, cleaned it, I had lots of religious content on my phone. Shulpan was not afraid, not alone in her fear of, of surveillance. Many of the dozens of others I interviewed as part of my research uh, for my, uh, my book project on re-education technology said that that they or others that they knew had, were detained because of digital texts, audio clips, and videos that they had shared on their smartphones. To be clear, already in 2014, when the Chinese state declared the People's War on Terror and began to discuss the 75 signs of Islamic extremism, which Rachel mentioned in her, her remarks, um, they began to list digital files, WhatsApp, and VPNs as signs of suspicion. But initially, none of these new regulations were enforced. Now, with uh, new surveillance tools, uh, their digital footprint from years prior could be used against them. So the, the kind of activities they were doing on WeChat back in 2014 and 15 were now detected uh, and, and being used um, against them. The surveillance system was a product of so-called preventative policing systems that drew on theories associated with the British prevent program, which has been mentioned in the previous panel, a prevent or CVE, countering violent extremism, relies on the theory that religious ideology or piety leads to violence. In Euro-America, it justifies cameras in mosques, teachers reporting on politically active Muslim students, um, and uh, watch lists, no-fly lists, all of those things. In China, it took on Chinese characteristics that drew on the Maoist past and counterinsurgency theory as practiced in Iraq and Palestine. Um, like people throughout the region, Shulpan had her irises, uh, and fa irises face and fingerprints scanned and her unique voice signature recorded. Um, they took her blood and a, a DNA sample. She said, uh, the village government leader told us openly that those who would refuse would be taken to a re-education camp. And this is a, an image of a, of a Uyghur person who went through this scanning, uh, recreating what that looked like. So the system is supported by this really unprecedented data set of, of face scans, iris scans, and DNA, all of that stuff. Um, the biometric data that was added to Shulpan's citizenship file as part of a new smart ID uh, card and checkpoint system um, enabled them to track her movement over space. Once this system was fully implemented by the end of 2017, it became impossible to enter a bank or shopping mall without having her face scanned and matched to the image on her ID at the fixed checkpoints at the entrance of every store. Um, Shulpan said, on average, over the span of a single day, I had my ID scanned more than 10 times. And this is a map that's showing um, from internal police documents from Arumchi, the capital of the region, uh, what the, the, the frequency of scanning and the data that's being collected. Um, this is done at a very large scale. Uh, Shulpan said that she also began to change her habits. At the advice of a police officer, Shulpan and her husband started going to dance parties and drinking in order to show that they were not religious. Once on their way home from a party, the police followed them and pulled them over. They asked both her and her husband to use a breathalyzer, using a device similar to this one. Um, even though she wasn't driving, they also tested her. When they found that her husband was not drunk, they asked him why he had, why he had not been drinking. He replied, <laughs> <laughs> he replied, I didn't drink because I had to drive. Um, which they, they grudgingly agreed to you know, saying that that was a legitimate reason not to drink. Um, they were pleased, however, to find that Shulpan's blood alcohol levels were elevated. Um, they didn't say anything and just let them go. Looking back at it now, Shulpan said, we had to perform the way they wanted us to perform. If they said drink, we drank. Many Turkic Muslims I have interviewed over the past two years have said that re-education technologies and the terror they feel because of the treatment of their relatives have, that they have received in detention have made them live their lives differently. 
they had always been very careful not to do anything wrong, but now they were intentional about posting content on their WeChat walls that reflected the talking points of the re-education campaign. Um, a lot of this centers around uh, something called uh, uh, demonstrating uh, positive energy. They, they posted things in Chinese rather than Kazakh and Uyghur. They smiled at Han people and served them first. They smiled and said, thank you, good, okay, yes, 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 ha, ha, sing, sing. They said that was the, the, the way that they just responded to everything. They did, everything, they did whatever they, could, they were assigned to do. They embraced post-truth as the new reality. It became normal. So what are the implications of all of this? Now, technology has been central in the modern history of systems of control, ranging from barbed wire and automatic weapons in North American internment camps uh, to the passbooks and check checkpoints of apartheid South Africa. Uh, the technology used in Chinese uh, projects to contain and transform Uyghur populations takes these systems of control in new techno-political directions. As Saskia Sassen notes, following 9-11, the built environment itself has become a technology of war. Um, in, uh, in a world of counterinsurgency and CVE, the pursuit of total knowledge of civilian populations through systematic assessment of their behavior and control of vital infrastructures is becoming the norm. For stateless populations, it is producing a new form of for-profit colonization, an intimate form of material and epistemic violence that seeks to eliminate and replace indigenous sociality. This economic and political formation, what I name terror capitalism, justifies the dispossession and exploitation of Muslim populations by defining them as potential terrorists or security threats. It attempts to generate profits in three interconnected ways. First, lucrative state contracts are given to private and state-owned corporations to build and deploy policing technologies that surveil and manage targeted groups. Then, using the vast amounts of biometric and social media data extracted from those groups, the private companies improve their technologies and sell real retail versions of them to other states and institutions, such as schools and corporations. Finally, all of this turns targeted groups into a ready source of cheap labor, either through direct coercion or indirectly through stigmas associated with their surveillance status. Already similar systems are, built, are being built in India, Palestine, and the southern border of the US, um, and in Hong Kong, where the slogan uh, that was used uh, kind of everywhere in Hong Kong, I was there in January, you see this everywhere, is today Xinjiang, tomorrow Hong Kong. These examples show us that uh, surveillance of marginalized people will likely get worse before it gets better. They demand a rearticulation of what the Taiwanese scholar Xu Mei Shi des describes as a minor transnational politics. To confront terror capitalism, a new social movement that links targeted communities to tech workers of conscience and builds legal frameworks and decolonial community de decolonial platforms is necessary. As Judith Butler would argue, um, this, is, this is what is necessary to truly make Shulpan's story count. Of course, her story does count, uh, but it's not always recognized, it's not always heard. Um, and the loss of her family, her family members, grievable. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, with, uh, and this is sort of a provocation or a way of thinking forward. It's how do we organize um, to resist this collectively? Um, because without it, um, we're left in a very difficult position. Um, and the marginalized people around us are, are, are going to be susceptible to really great harms. So thank you very much. Rahima, Rahima I'll, I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to be here to uh, talk about uh, the situation. As being Uyghur myself, um, uh, I would like to, I would like to uh, talk uh, through my own uh, personal experience and to give you a bit more inside stories 
uh, what is happening at the moment. And I'm sure the previous speakers have already uh, mentioned um, quite a lot. So I was born in the city of Holja, of um, what was East Turkestan, but the uh, Chinese call it Xinjiang. I was brought up in a, a large religious family. Uh, the discrimination and the persecution of the Uyghur people has a long history. As a Uyghur, I experienced from my childhood until when I left my homeland in 2000, frequent discrimination and witnessed brutal crackdowns on moderate dissenting voices, especially uh, the massacre of in Rulja massacre in 1997. So since coming to the UK in 2000, I have not been able to return home uh, because of my involvement in the activism against the human rights violation against my people by the Chinese government. The last time I spoke to my brother was in January 2017, and he told me in a shaking voice, please leave us to God's hand and we will leave you to God's hand too. My work as an interpreter and translator brings me first-hand information on those who have suffered in notorious 21st century internment camps, as well as the heart-wrenching accounts of mothers and fathers who have lost their children, young and old, Every Uyghur family has a similar story, one more horrible than the other. As a result of the brutal ethnic cleansing and cultural genocide that have been taking place since 2017, behind the closed eyes of the international community, the most painful part of the job is that I cannot offer those in pain and suffering any words of comfort and hope. I worked as a consultant and a translator for the documentary Undercover China's Digital Gulag by Robin Banwal, which was broadcasted on ITV in July 2009, 2019. Information was gained through both interviews with those that had experienced and escaped the camps and through an undercover operative within the Uyghur region. There's one part, if uh, people uh, didn't watch this uh, documentary, I would recommend you uh, to watch it. Um, this is one, uh, one part uh, I believe uh, is most extraordinary uh, account by the Chinese uh, official. So this is the conversation between uh, the undercover uh, reporter and the uh, Chinese official in Urumqi. So this is what he said. The authorities say it is a special situation here. What is happening is excessive and too extreme. The people, the police look at Uyghurs with suspicion. If a Uyghur refuses to be checked or asks why, they just lock them up. There is no procedure. So the undercover um, reporter asked, do Uyghurs feel their human rights are being violated? They don't have human rights. It is not about violation. They just don't have human rights. And a Uyghur IT expert who uh, worked for a state-controlled high-tech surveillance company, uh, we interviewed him, uh, the extensive interview, uh, record is with me, I can share some of <coughs> what he said about this uh, uh, surveillance uh, situation. He said, everyone was fearful, whether those already taken inside or those who are waiting to be taken in. Our relatives under influence of the state terror dare not even greet one another openly without, where, without fear. It is unbearable to describe life there. A knock on the door from anyone would bring extreme anxiety and fright. So on my last visit uh, in uh, 
the country, I spoke to the, the expert again, and uh, he told me that he, uh, last time he spoke to his mother, he learned that his neighbor's daughter had hanged herself after being released from the camp on the, on the same day. I have also worked as a translator for the BBC documentary, China, A New World Order. And the, the interview records and translating the interview records was heartbreaking. And I would like to just share this um, one mother's story. This is what she said. My mother-in-law was looking after my children, my sister-in-law, could not get hold of my mother-in-law for a few days. So she went to visit. When my sister-in-law got there, the children told her, our grandmother was taken away by police three days ago. My mother-in-law is 72 years old. I could not believe it. She is old and in poor health. She started sobbing. Three days after my mother-in-law was arrested, my children, were taken to an orphanage. My heart was just torn apart. I never thought that this kind of disaster could happen to me. And this is just a one example. This lady came to Turkey because her father was ill. And she came in 2016. And when she uh, wanted to return, that is a time when this uh, uh, mass arrest started, so she's trapped, couldn't, couldn't go back. Her mother-in-law was looking after her children, a 72-year-old woman, and uh, so police uh, arrested her, and then three days later, all her children were taken away. Up until now, she doesn't know uh, what happened to her children. The most difficult part of the interpreting job is to interpret, uh, to, to work, especially um, uh, to interview the, the people who suffered extreme torture, especially rape. Um, only two weeks ago, uh, I went to Germany to interview um, a lady called Rukia. We call her name as Rukia. And uh, um, we spent five hours um, I had to ask the um, researcher to leave the room because I couldn't translate. Uh, it's impossible for me to, to translate the details of uh, this, uh, the scene and the, the, how it happened. It was just too much. Um, and uh, she said, uh, the rape in prison and in camps, 99% uh, women are actually experiencing that, but they wouldn't say because they feel too ashamed to say it. Um, therefore, she said, I have to tell the world because this is extreme situation and the world should, should know what, what happened. I think I should leave uh, my my speech here, and then maybe any any questions I can. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rahima. Um, so now we'll ask Nisha to to give her presentation. Um, thank you. Thanks uh, to the organisers for inviting me. I'm Nisha Kapoor. I'm a, an associate professor at the University of Warwick in the sociology department. Um, my research has broadly um, focused on the war on terror um, in, in the UK and the US, looking at sort of extreme cases of individuals who have been impacted by things like um, citizenship, um, so extreme cases in, in the sense of state um, disciplinary measures. So looking at uh, individuals who have been subjected to citizenship deprivation, passport removals, extradition, um, deportation, so on. Um, and I had a, a book um, uh, out a couple of years ago um, with Verso called Deport Deprived Extradite, which is part of a, a broader project looking at um, 
documenting these cases, but also thinking about what they illuminate about the sort of authoritarian practices being enhanced uh, through the security state, you know, in the name of the war on terror. So my, um, subsequent to that, I've, I've um, been increasingly looking at surveillance um, and surveillance capitalism. I, my knowledge of the sort of Chinese context is, is very sort of tentative, so it's been, um, really great to be part of this because it is something that I've been thinking um, a bit more about. But my comments um, really today are focused more on kind of outside China, but thinking about the um, trade links, I guess, and the sort of competition between um, the US and the UK um, and the discourse of human rights that gets play, played out within this sort of uh, surveillance capital, uh, with this um, sort of uh, competitive context between um, or between the, U the US and, the, and China mostly, with the UK being a really important trading market um, for the competition um, of surveillance technologies be between um, the other states. So, um, I mean, I, I'll begin by just saying um, something about some of the artificial intelligence, some of the surveillance technologies that have been cultivated by Google um, in the name of, you know, through the war on terror as part of, try, in the uh, frame or justified in terms of trying to make the internet a safer place. Um, so the wealth of um, artificial inte intelligence being generated en masse by companies such as Google, who surveil our online behavior to create what Shishana Zuboff has termed prediction products that anticipate what we will do now, soon, and later, is a project that's not simply rooted in the desire to make us better consumers, but actually is a project intricately embedded in the US military objective of conducting information war. Um, for which it realized in the late 1980s, early 1990s, that the internet and social media would be essential. Um, Nafiz Ahmed, uh, an investigative journalist, has laid out in great detail the intricate connections between the US military and security agencies and Google, not least through the circulation of personnel between these two camps and the creation of networks between governments and big tech for enabling this. And although there's much to kind of comment on and reflect on this relationship, I just want to stress that surveillance capitalism is deeply tied to the securitization agenda of the war on terror, where surveillance techniques and technologies are being cultivated through a focus, as we have heard this morning, on uh, Muslim suspect communities. So we see this partnership um, between the military, security services, and Google come to the fore um, in multiple ways, but one particular sort of interesting way is through Google's Jigsaw project, um, of which Yasmin Green is the research and development um, director. Um, um, last year, at the end of last year, Vogue, um, many of you might have followed, uh, fronted a cover of three women, Muslim women, who have play, you know, leading management roles in the counterterrorism industry, um, real kind of glamorizing pictures, sort of showing, uh, glamorizing the counterterrorism industry, if you like, but kind of playing on, you know, the role of feminism in, uh, in liberation or sort of, um, in, in sort of West counterterrorism um, agendas and um, playing on the ideas around human rights, freedom of speech, um, and sort of an imperialist feminist um, reinvigoration. Mm -hmm. um, and so Yasmin Green was one of these women um, who, as I said, is the research and development director of Jigsaw and has overseen projects such as the creation of the animated character um, Abdullah X, who fronts a YouTube series voiced by a former extremist who's a I think actually a British Pakistani, um, that explores themes of young Muslim identity in society and aims to steer young minds away from extremism. And also another project called the um, Redirect Method, which Jigsaw states is focused on reaching those who are actively looking for extremist content and connections and uses pre-existing YouTube content and targeted advertising to direct young people off the path to extremism. So what you have through these projects um, that Google are using um, through this animated YouTube series and also through uh, the Redirect Method is the profiling of, of um, individuals 
online um, and the, the sort of manipulation of search engines to um, redirect them or to um, steer what content gets seen. So the kinds of censorship or redirection that we usually hear about in the Chinese context is being used um, in certain ways uh, through these projects like the redirect method. And so, um, for example, in the TED talk that Yasmin Green does, she talks about how if you search you know, how can I join ISIS, that you'll be redirected to other information about, um, you know, either academic articles or sort of more um, critical articles about kind of what ISIS is and does, uh, or, or, or articles that work in the interests of um, uh, Western agendas. So, um, and, and that's unlike uh, the results that you get if you search, how can I join the IDF or how can I join the RSS? Um, you know, there, there are a, a distinctions, um, but the I, but the but the the sort of um, the the discourse or the rhetoric that's um, narrated around this project is is around kind of um, keeping people safe, is around dealing with uh, extremism, de-radicalization, um, and freedom of speech. Um, Yasmin Green, along with others such as Sarah Khan and Nikita Malik, as I said, have been celebrated for glamorizing the counterterrorism industry, for drawing on liberal feminist notions of human rights discourses and, and freedom of speech to justify the surveillance and suppression and criminalization of suspect or, or vulnerable Muslim youth. Um, this kind of imperialist feminism has not hurt Google's reputation, but to the contrary has been celebrated as one way in which Google can play a progressive security, uh, a role in progressive securitization measures. Google has certainly um, not received the same kind of international scrutinization for human, right, human rights abuses in that context. Um, it's taken collaboration um, it, sorry, it's, it has taken the sort of collaboration with um, the, the sort of far right Trump regime uh, and its role in China for Google to come under critique from its staff members for participation in military programs um, and for its um, role in developing the, the Dragonfly project. Um, so Google was providing um, AI assistance as part of something called Project Maven, which was a drone program for the Pentagon. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, um, Google's kind of initiation has been very much about uh, being closely tied with um, military, um, with uh, military agendas uh, in the US. Um, but following protests from its staff opposing the deal and calling Google to write a new charter to block, on, uh, to block work on weaponized AI, Google subsequently has ended its contract with the Pentagon uh, openly and um, has, has also, uh, it was stated last year, officially suspended its work with China on its um, Dragonfly project, which was a censoring search engine um, developed for the Chinese, Chinese market. So what I, I really um, I'm trying to get at, and this is just stuff that I'm starting to think about, so it's not as coherent as as um, formed as um, you know I'd like it to be, but th th I guess that's for discussion, is to really think about problematizing um, the way in which human rights in relation to China gets invoked in the West, um, because well, one, we, ha we have this situation where both the sort of far right invokes um, for nationalist and for sort of trade reasons invokes, um, you know, human rights reasons, as we heard at the end of the last panel, um, in relation, you know, as, as legitimation for kind of not working with China or for seeing China as a security threat. And we also have um, the sort of liberal left factions um, invoking kind of a human rights argument in relation to surveillance technologies, not necessarily because the surveillance technologies themselves are a problem, but because of which corporations are actually um, doing the work. So, you know, you have Amnesty, for example, talking about uh, if we're going to em employ certain surveillance technologies in the UK, that we need to sort of think about the source of those technologies, which companies are providing the technologies, rather than thinking about the problem of the technologies themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, which, which is really my point. So the, um, against um, 
So against this kind of ongoing trade war between the US and China, it's generally, it has generally been in Google's interest to maintain a collaborative relationship with Chinese big tech and surveillance corporations. In July 2019, The Intercept reported that the Open Power Foundation, a nonprofit organization founded by Google and IBM, set up a collaboration between um, IBM, Chinese company Semtian, and a US chip manufacturer, Exalinx, I think that's how you say it. Um, together, they have worked to advance a breed of microprocessors that enable computers to analyze vast amounts of data more efficiently. So China and the US, or, or China and US companies are working together to do this. According to Ryan Gallagher's investigative journalist report, um, Semtium, um, which is Shenzhen-based uh, company, is using the devices, um, these microchip things, to um, microprocessors, um, to um, enhance the capabilities of internet surveillance and sensitive censorship technology it provides to security agencies in China. Um, a company employee said that its technology is being uh, used to covertly monitor the internet activity of 200 million people. So the, um, through a subsidiary company uh, of, called INEX, um, it's selling internet surveillance and censorship tools to governments, um, and it's working with US companies in order to, to develop um, technologies to enhance its ability to do this. Um, Google's mission to expand its surveillance empire to China is of, like constrained by these two opposing, you know, as I said, by these two kind of um, factions. One, you have kind of Trump's alt-right factions who are invoking sort of nationalist trade interests to sort of, uh, and, and are using human rights to, to um, argue that, uh, to condemn Google for its um, interactions and um, with Chinese companies. Um, and, and you also have the protests, as we've heard by its employees, um, for different reasons, but, but, but also kind of invoking um, similar human rights reasons. Um, and what you have um, then is this kind of coming to the fore um, for my uh, purposes in the UK, where the, 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 we've heard a lot recently about um, Britain's contracts with Huawei and it, the, the extent to which um, they would be allowed access to um, Britain's 5G network and um, telecommunications stuff. Um, but there has been... Um, Britain itself, uh, the UK, is an attractive prospect beyond telecommunications. Britain, the UK, is an attractive um, prospect for any company working in the security industry um, because it's one of the most surveilled countries in the world with up to an estimated 6 million cameras, one for every 11 people throughout its towns and cities. Um, so it's a kind of, you know, really ideal market. And in terms of artificial intelligence, of which uh, artificial intelligence technology where China is uh, leading the world. Um, the UK is currently um, sourcing products from mostly from Hik Hik Hikvision, um, NEC, which is a Japanese company, and Palantir, which is the US rival. Um, and so the the um, The human rights, um, sorry, the, a, a recent report by um, Stephen Felden shows that technology linked to Chinese companies, particularly um, Huawei, Doha, and ZTE, supply AI surveillance technology in 63 countries, um, 36 of which have signed on to China, China's Belt and Road Initiative. But Huawei is responsible for providing um, AI surveillance technology to at least 50 countries worldwide. No other company comes close. Um, in contrast, AI surveillance technology supplied by the US is present in 32 countries. So we see that the kind of trade war, um, that the, the security um, reasons, the, the security risks that are currently being invoked by the US are really underpinned by the difference in, in um, market um, access. Um, the most significant U.S. companies for, um, for uh, AI technology are IBM, Palantir, and Cisco. So um, 
we have, um, what, what's kind of interesting in terms of how this is playing out in the UK is that you have, um, on the one hand, Palantir, which is headed by um, Peter Thiel, who is um, a big Trump-supporting um, venture capitalist um, uh, who is... Um, who has not been able to kind of crack the, the Chinese market, I think, in the way um, that he would have liked, but who has um, secured controversially and quietly uh, a 20 million, £28 million pound contract from the Ministry of Defence last year um, in the UK, taking the total value of UK government deals won by the company to at least £39 million. Pounds. Um, Palantir has become a lightning rod um, for concerns in Silicon Valley, um, uh, and but has actually maintained quite a low profile in the UK um, comparatively, even though its offices are actually, um, its UK office is now its largest um, and has taken responsibility for, con for a number of kind of military context contracts, but also is developing, um, is, is also providing welfare. So the AI technology that's now being used um, in, as part of... Um, uh, the social credit system in, in the UK by welfare um, in, in order to administer benefit claims um, is, now being is now being run by Palantir Technologies, by Palantir IA, AI Technologies. Um, so 140 councils out of 408 have used, are using Palantir software, um, running into kind of millions of pounds in order to, um, ad, ad, you know, to, as part of the results of cuts and austerity measures that have been delivered in the UK, which means that there are less people um, working in, um, in delivering um, uh, in the benefit, in the welfare uh, system. And on the other hand, you have Hikvision, uh, whose camera technologies, who are AI technologies have been developed through the Skynet program, uh, tested and uh, developed in Xinjiang, um, being, you, you know, Hikvision cameras being used um, prolifically in the UK, across the London Underground, across parliamentary um, uh, the estate, across London, bur uh, across um, London boroughs, across um, boroughs in the UK, um, in public spaces, by private companies in um, in shopping malls and shopping markets, um, in schools, in hospitals, uh, at universities. Uh, I think it's something like 1.2 million Hikvision cameras are, are, are sort of um, reported to be in use in the UK with all um, the possibilities that that allows for. So um, I don't, I'm kind of running out of time and I'm, I'm, um, I don't have a kind of a nice conclusion, um, but it, it's just really to to ask or to invoke us to to provoke us to think a bit more critically about the way in which um human rights arguments sort of get invoked in the in, in the context outside of china um as, as to think sort of a bit more critically about sort of what it means in relation to the the politics the um market politics um between different corporations are, are, who are fighting for um you know market access to uh, for their own sort of profit reasons thank you thank you Nisha. so now we should have hopefully we should have maya wong from from the states uh, on on skype maya can you hear us Yes. Great. Um, can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. So okay. you, uh, over to you. Can you introduce um, yourself, hi, Maya, please? Yes. Um, I'm the senior researcher on China for Human Rights Watch. I'm actually based in Hong Kong. So, oh, um, and um, thank you for inviting me. And um, I unfortunately am not able to be there. Um, so it's like, you know, sorry if I might have repeated some of the things people have said earlier. Um, I think my presentation is kind of sits somewhere between um, Darren and Rahima uh, on one hand and Nisha on the other. I would just describe a little bit about kind of China's mass surveillance systems. Um, I've studied China mostly in the last decade um, with a focus on Xinjiang and surveillance in the last couple of years. Um, 
we have observed basically that the Chinese government's um, implementation of mass surveillance systems as far back as year 2000, um, nearly two, two, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, we have seen it, it developed as a multi-layered kind of multi-dimensional program. Um, at, the, at the kind of very basic of the, the system is the use of uh, the requirement that everybody has to have an ID number um, and the requirement that people have to use their real name in accessing many kind of services, including uh, when they travel on long distance buses, uh, getting a SIM card for the phone, getting broadband internet. And then at the next layer is uh, the use of biometrics um, and uh, the use of artificial intelligence. The collection, I think Darren also mentioned, of facial images, voice samples, iris scans, DNA, and this kind of collection is mass um, and often um, without being tied to kind of criminal record or criminal suspicion. Um, in, in Xinjiang, for example, um, the, these kind of biometrics are being taken from uh, children as young as 12 years old as a requirement. Um, and then in addition, there is also the collection of uh, phone identifying information, um, IMEI number and MAC addresses of people's phones have been collected and put into massive databases run by the police. Um, and what is interesting um, in Xinjiang in particular, but also across China, is the use of kind of multiple authentic authentication technique. So when you go through your life in Xinjiang, it's not just about, you know, facial, the use of facial recognition to identify you, but uh, when you walk through checkpoints, you're presenting your ID, you're present you're, you're going through facial recognition, but um, the data, the, the, the checkpoints are also equipped with these things called data doors, or some of the checkpoints are equipped with these things called data doors that look a bit like a security checkpoint when you walk through. Um, but unbeknown to the person walking through it, the data doors are also pulling your um, IMEI number, your MAC address from your phone to identify who you are. And if there's any kind of irregularities between your phone, your face, and your ID, these data doors send alert the authorities to flag you as someone who is um, somewhat problematic. Um, so this kind of, in the past, if you look at surveillance by um, government or by companies, um, you have some ways to circumvent that. Like we have worked with human rights offenders over time, and then we teach them how to secure the device, right? Like, you know, um, use VPN or use whatever to avoid the kind of device level um, uh, surveillance. Now, this, these kind of surveillance is getting even more intrusive. It's moving towards the physical biometric level. Um, and in multiple ways, it's very difficult. I mean, let's say we develop some kind of mask to go uh, around facial recognition someday. In fact, there's already at the beginning of such uh, masks. But, you know, if you walk through data door, it's going to be very difficult to avoid three different types of um, recognition altogether to uh, avoid detection and tracking by the state. Um, at the top level, uh, after kind of biometrics and the use of artificial intelligence is the use of big data programs. And again, you see that in Xinjiang, the use of integrated joint operations platform, a big data system that Human Rights Watch um, published a report about last year, where we, where we discovered that um, the authorities are using big data system to kind of you know, receive information from multiple sensory systems across the region. And by sensory systems, I mean mostly uh, the data doors I was talking about, but also facial recognition systems or um, CCTV cameras, surveillance cameras installed in public places. These sensory systems contributing to information to this big data uh, system, IJOP, and the IJOP also gets information from uh, government officials who have these phone apps that they go around to collect data from uh, people in the region. And any kind of irregularities, like I said, if they are using a device that doesn't belong to them, if they are driving a car that doesn't belong to them, uh, if they use too much electricity, if they enter the house through the back door instead of the front door, if they donate too much money into the mosque, these kind of irregularities as defined by the system 
by the engineers in the system who decide that too much electricity is a sign of extremism. Um, the system then alerts government officials to go and interrogate the, um, the, the Turkic Muslims involved and go and ask them specific questions and then vet them for um, some of them go into political education camps. Um, so the reason why I think, um, so I, I want to talk about these different layers is because I think it is important when we think about the diffusion or the um, the use of surveillance in Xinjiang, in China, across the world. I think there are different kinds of mass surveillance we're talking about. Um, if you look at um, the Xinjiang, if you look at Xinjiang compared to the rest of China, you see that the rest of China are also using these similar layers of surveillance, very similar ideas, very in similar infrastructure, except that in Xinjiang is much more intrusive and visible. Um, elsewhere in China, you have uh, similar layers, but at the same time, there was, I think, a significant resistance, um, sorry, not significant, some, but growing a, a bit of resistance against this kind of surveillance from the population. Um, last year, we had parents being very uncomfortable about these um, brain detecting kind of ring on your head um, that supposedly detect pay, um, students level of concentration in schools that those devices used in a couple of schools were actually stopped by the uh, relevant education authorities i can't remember which province um, you also have a law professor suing a private zoo in um in china about the use of facial recognition when you enter the zoo um, you also have when beijing announced in 2019 that they were going to combine use facial recognition to sort people into different buckets for security vetting so like when you go into the subway uh people are subjected to security checks but beijing says well uh in, in beijing subway they're going to um depending on your facial recognition results we're going to divide you into different risk level um that kind of announcement created a lot of debate um in beijing and beyond about the use of surveillance technologies so that was some kind of resistance um in China about these or some good discussion about these technologies. Um, but these kind of resistance, I think, had been pretty much eliminated during the coronavirus outbreak. Um, and it's interesting to me that now with the virus outbreak, the government is arguing that, well, as an emergency, we must use these kind of technologies. We are seeing, for example, the development of this system called Health Code, where um, people are divided into red green oh sorry red yellow and green buckets um, red means you have to be quarantined for 14 days for uh because of the virus and then green means you can go anywhere and yellow is somewhere in between seven days of quarantine and in china quarantine conditions are pretty harsh and rough your um and uh the health code also makes this determination um uh, based on kind of algorithm that is unclear like just precisely how people ended up in in red versus green and how one day to another people can go from green and yellow that has um uh, is also a big question uh but in, uh, importantly the health code app is a little bit like a little bit like Xinjiang, uh, not 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 entirely, uh, you know, comparable, where um, the health code app is dependent on intrusive surveillance. So the health code app um, generates this kind of color code depending on where you have been, uh, who you have been in touch with, and. Uh, and also send your real-time location data to the police unbeknown to you. Um, and it also implements a certain kind of movement restrictions that in some ways also similar to Xinjiang. So um, you can see that in China, these kind of levels of surveillance um, also become uh, increasingly uh, kind of resemble uh, what is happening in Xinjiang. And then you have outside of China. Um, in like the Philippines, in uh, Zimbabwe, in um, Kyrgyzstan, you see the diffusion of kind of similar kind of technologies. Um, I think uh, Nisha, you're talking about both US and Japanese and Chinese companies selling these kind of technologies. Uh, what we see though, I think for Chinese technologies, right now we are seeing more kind of facial recognition systems being sold to these other countries. Um, and not so much kind of these multi-layered, multi-dimensional systems being um, present in, in these other countries. Um, and I call, them, I, I call these technologies in other countries kind of more off-the-shelf facial recognition systems because facial recognition is kind of like neat and packaged. You can kind of like sell them. Um, 
but I would expect that given how, you know, if you look at internet censorship and internet, the, the Golden Shield projects, uh, sorry, uh, the use of the Great Firewall and internet censorship diffusion between, from China to the rest of the world, it took a, a decade or two for this kind of China model to diffuse to different parts of the world. And it might be that we will be seeing more over time that the Xinjiang model would spread beyond Xinjiang, but also kind of like beyond China as well. Um, and I am not entirely kind of pessimistic about that. Uh, and I can I can explain why. Um, but I would also respond to what Nisha was saying, how um, I think the use of surveillance technologies um, is not just a uniquely, well, China or Xinjiang problem. You're absolutely right. Um, you, you see, I think Darren was mentioning how, you know, in the border, uh, if the US, you see the vast collection of DNA on migrants, the use of facial recognition in mosques. In the Netherlands, um, recently, the court just overturned uh, this uh, algorithm automated decision making processes that are used to surveil welfare recipients. Um, and the use of artificial intelligence automated decision making are increasingly across the world being trained on marginalized peoples um, and, and increasing the power of the state. And to such an extent that I worry that over time is going to so significantly erode human rights and democracies around the world. Um, and I think what we need, and as an advocacy organization, as Human Rights Watch, is a global, uh, is an international standards that ring in um, these kind of, the use of these kind of technologies and have some kind of human rights standards that, that speak to the use of these technologies worldwide. Um, and uh, you can see why that is important because in Xinjiang, we can see, well, in China, there's almost no law or regulations that regulate the use of, well, the collection of private data, uh, personal information uh, to, to circumscribe the, the surveillance power of the state such that essentially the government can do whatever they want. And in the places where they can do most what they want, i.e. Xinjiang, the intrusiveness is the greatest. Whereas in places like Hong Kong, which um, Darren also mentioned, um, the fact that we have privacy laws uh, courtesy of, of, the, of the British colonialism um, did protect Hong Kong from the worst types of um, surveillance that you actually see in China. Um, Hong Kong is actually still leading um, the region uh, in terms of the protection of privacy rights, despite it being uh, increasingly under threats uh, under uh, Chinese rule. So I would just end there and say, well, I think a lot of these systems, if you look around the world, just we are talking about facial recognition, not, not the Xinjiang or the China multi-dimensional kind of type of surveillance. A lot of these systems are actually quite new. They were put in place in 2019, and there is possibility to roll them back um, if um, if we actually stigmatize their use around the world. So thank you, and I'll end there. Uh, to BS his fine tradition of abusing the position of the chair by a three quick question, four questions of my own, hopefully to give you time to formulate even better questions. So, um, uh, first, first question to to Darren. Really, Darren, uh, fantastic presentation. Really, really detailed stuff. Um, two questions, really. One is a kind of a little bit about method, and second is more about the implications. Is how do you do it? How can you do this research in Xinjiang? Uh, so it's kind of a methodological question there, really. And second is, what do you think, based on your knowledge of the technologies, will be the implications of what's happening technologically-wise around surveillance for future research, either by you or by others following in, your, in, in, in the trail, trail you're blazing now, or Adrian Sands or others? Um, and and to, to Rahima and, and that profoundly moving um, presentation, Rahima. Um, it struck me that the the contrast really between the kind of high tech horror that Darren talked about and the very physical horror that you talked about and 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 the, and it kind of made me think really of of, of of the very worst forms of colonialism of stolen children of language repression of 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 rape of Hannah Arendt's you invoked Hannah Arendt's the right to have rights by quoting that that policeman, uh, and it made me think of, of uh, uh, Mandani's research where he also evoked Hannah Arendt's work looking at the Congo, and and I'm, I'm wondering, my my question would be how how do you see 
the way to combat this? Is it simply, is it, is it simply, simply is not the word, is it a question of confronting what is essentially a colonial, if not colonialism, then a colonial narrative? Or is this other stuff around surveillance technology all equally important? Does that make sense, that question? Thanks. Uh, um, uh, uh, Nisha, m my question, again, great presentation. My question there is, does it matter? And it's following on, really, from, from what Maya, Maya talked about towards the end of her talk. Does it matter who owns the technology? Does it matter if it's sourced from a company operating, and this doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of globalisation, that, that is restricted, at least to a certain extent, by liberal democracy checks and balances? That, that we don't see in more authoritarian states? Or does, is that mattering less and less now? Which seems to be the way your, your talk was going. And, and thank you, Maya, for, you, for, for your, for your uh, very rich talk there. M my question there is, I mean, it was a very comprehensive talk, so I'm, I'm going to kind of, my question is going to be on, on something that you maybe didn't mention, mention, but I know Human Rights Watch has, has, has some data on, which is, you noted in one of your reports, I forget which one, maybe the 2019 one, is that recently um, that some of the camps, satellite images are suggesting that some of the detainment camps in Xinjiang are being closed and the prisoners, that about 80,000 prisoners, maybe Darren can speak to this, are being shipped off in various forms of what you guys call coercive labour to other fa to factories in China, maybe to do work that hand workers aren't yet willing to do because of the virus, and, and, and also the, the transfer of, of other prisoners to... Um, to the kind of the, the, the other detainees, shall we say, to the to the to the larger prison system in in Xinjiang, and I wonder if you could speak to that for a little. So, if we if we go in that that order, um, maybe start start with Darren and work through it briefly, and then we can open it up to the, to, to the room. Sure. Uh Great, uh, great questions. Um, so, uh, how did I do this research uh, <laughs> carefully? That, that, <laughs> that <laughs> I've been going to this region for ten years now as a researcher, um, and because of that, I have lots and lots of connections, a lot of social network, um, and I've seen changes over time. And so, the last time I was there was 2018, um, which was you know already hundreds of thousands of people sent to camps, or over a million sent to camps. Lots of people had disappeared, checkpoints everywhere. Um, and so I couldn't really interview the form, my, the, my friends. Um, I didn't contact them. Some of them were in, in camp, so it was impossible. Um, but uh, I would, was being watched by the camera system, so I was very careful. It was an observational uh, ethnographic uh, trip. So I went through checkpoints, uh, observed how people went through them. Um, often I was detained several times. and. That's informative too. Is I wasn't I, at checkpoints. I don't speak Uyghur. I just speak Chinese, and so they don't know that I understand what's being said in Uyghur. Um, and so you can really pick up on what what's happening in those spaces and kind of see how the mechanics of the system, how it works, the forms of terror as they're moving from body to body um, in those spaces. Um, but the most uh, kind of rich ethnographic detail I've gotten is through going to Kazakhstan and, and, and to Turkey. I haven't been to Turkey, but I've heard people have gone to Turkey. There's people there that you can speak to who have come out recently. Um, and in Kazakhstan, there's lots of Kazakhs uh, from China um, who have come across the border in the over the last three years, um, and they can speak to what the system was like, how they lived with it. Um, the, I was just there for about a week this last trip, and... Over that week, I spoke to 40 people, uh, interviewed 40 people. Uh, there, the call goes out that the researcher is in town, and then people show up uh, to be interviewed. There's like a waiting list. Uh, like People wait all day to speak to you. So there's lots of people to speak to and lots of opportunities for researchers to do this kind of work. Um, I think it does really advantage you if you have a background, you understand what the system is like, and so you can ask you know, pretty informed questions and, and sort of fill out the data set that way. Um, what does it mean for future research? That's a good question. Um, there are people in the diaspora you can talk to. That's one thing. Um, but you can also use the master's tools. Um, because all of this is online, it's, it's digital. Um, if you have friends that know how to obtain materials, like Maya does and, and others, um, you can get data very quickly. Um, so we can assess things using satellite imagery. We can use nightlight vision to see if these camps are actually being closed or not. Um, and we can get the internal police reports, 40,000 of them is what I'm working through right now, um, that show in very 
specific detail what's happening on the ground, the capacities of the system, um, and what are its limits. So, so there's some knowledge we can gain. It's not enough to push back against the system. We need the global stigma of these systems to actually get it, get it motivated and going, but, but that's one, one thing that can be done. Um, thank you. That's quite an important question. And um, direct answer how to combat uh, this evil. Um, Sometimes I think that every, every morning when I, when I wake up, I think about that question. And uh, how is there any way that the situation can change? But what motivates me is that the more truths come out, the better. So uh, the, the real human stories, the human suffering, and also more women uh, especially, I guess uh, I believe now that it's about approximately 27% women are in, in camps. Um, I translated the book, uh, The Land that Dren uh, Drenched in Tears. <clears throat> And in that book, it's a memoir, uh, a story of a, a Tata woman, Sungul Chanishev, and her life during uh, Cultural Revolution and before uh, Cultural Revolution imprisonment. And um, when I compare what, what is happening now and uh, compare what had happened that time, uh, and we can say it's maybe 100 times worse. Um, last time when I spoke to uh, Suyungul Chanshev, and she said, at least I had freedom even in that little uh, cell uh, because there wasn't camera watching me. Um, and I had uh, some time uh, opportunity to speak to the people uh, next, next cell, pretending reading newspaper aloud. But at the moment, um, that is not uh, that, that is uh, not the case. It's extremely even in your own home, you don't have that that freedom. Um, so uh, in exposing this, and uh, also uh, very glad that uh, the document leaks uh, uh, that leaked uh, in November tw twice, um, then recent document. Um, so I think that when the truths uh, are exposed, more people can um, join the, the, the campaign. And uh, uh, maybe, I, I, I mean, I just hopeful that the, I'm not uh, expert in legal uh, pr procedures, but uh, I wonder whether uh, there will be an international um, action uh, also the uh, the Chinese people uh, whether they can take any, any any action after all this truth being revealed because a lot of time people don't believe what is happening but now I think uh, more and pe more people are believing this and then having all these most terrifying stories being told uh, brave people like uh, um, uh, Sayra Gül, like Uruqiya, like uh, Jelulova, they uh, have been coming forward to tell their experience. And I think that is very powerful. And number one uh, for any uh, organizations or countries to take action is, first of all, they must learn the truth. So I think that is uh, quite, quite powerful. Thank you, Rahim. Nisha. Uh, yeah, so does, does it matter um, who owns the technology? Um, no. I mean, so I, I mean, I guess the, um, I guess there are a number of points. I think sometimes the, the problem with um, the idea that there is um, artificial intelligence or surveillance technologies that are used with more checks and balances in liberal democracies versus authoritarian states is to kind of m not recognize the point that liberal democracies on paper are, um, I think, as Natasha was saying in the earlier 
um, panel are, you know, are trying, you know, doing what they can to you, you know, they're sort of envious of the authoritarian states for being able to use surveillance technologies in a more efficient way. So it's always a kind of dance um, to uh, try and Im impose some of these surveillance technologies within a framework that alludes to um, something democratic. But the very premise of the surveillance technologies is, you know, is anti what we would think of is is in its very essence um, contradictory to a kind of genuine sort of democratic settlement. So, I mean, I think even in the, like um, Darren was saying about the use of surveillance technologies on the border in the US, and equally we can think about the UK, these, the, the technologies that are used against Muslim communities, so even like the Cambridge Analytica scandal or, as I was mentioning, the stuff that Google does, doesn't arouse public upset because it's happening to Muslims, it's not happening en masse. And even when we have the debate around um, around privacy and when, you know, it was revealed about how much communications data the state does have access to and monitors, it was a kind of, you know, a debate around the surveillance that's necessary and the surveillance for all. And um, you know, with a, a range of different responses from, well, you know, if you've got nothing to hide, then you don't need to worry to, um, you know, protect most of us, but just do, you know, surveil the terrorists and not everybody else. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think we always have to kind of think about what's happening sort of within states as well as the sort of broader global capitalist um, dynamics around sort of trade and, and to, to, to think critically about sort of disingenuous, um, you know, invocations of human rights that often get voked for, invoked for uh, other reasons. Thanks, Nisha. Maya. Um, <clears throat> I would like to just respond to, to that question as well. And um, I actually, well, as, as someone and as an organization that is kind of deep in the trenches of, of fighting against uh, surveillance technologies globally, I actually think it makes a huge difference. I mean, not a huge difference, a major difference. Um, we, I mean, just as an example, uh, we could be sitting in London talking about surveillance technologies and not to fear the police would barge in and basically take every one of us <laughs> to the cell. Um, I think that's a testimony of why um, civil society, free press, uh, the independent courts matter um, in having debates and raising awareness, um, which is something that we can't do. We can't have this panel in Xinjiang. And I think um, when we write to surveil when we write to companies about their surveillance technologies, we do get responses usually from companies that are based in um, democracies and not to uh, uh, not to kind of uh, uh, underplay the enormity of the challenge of holding companies like Google or Facebook, which, which are just really big companies, very powerful ones, um, accountable. Um, the fact is that we have very, very little leverage over companies like iFlyTech, uh, like MACV, like SenseTime, that are based in China. Um, they can also wage um, many different battles against those of us who try to uh, expose these abuses, um, raising personal cost imprisonment. And I, I'm not saying that they, you know, as a company do that, but, you know, they are they're backed and, and related to uh, a state that is very powerful reaching those of us outside of China as well. I mean, uh, the reason some of us sitting in Hong Kong also face risks that are increasing uh, similar to, to China just for simply researching about some of these issues. So I would just emphasize that it, it to those who, uh, to people who I think feel, um, you know, the, these companies are so big, it's really difficult to challenge, I think, you, we have a bit of more leverage outside of, of, of um, China um, or in democratic societies. Um, so I think that's one point. And then I, I think the other issue about forced labor changing gears, um, I think first of all, we have to be very skeptical about the Chinese government's claims that all of the detainees in these political education camps have been released. The claim is actually that all of them have been released. As I understand, some of the uh, Uyghurs in particular uh, have, uh, outside of China, continued to not to know anything about what had happened to their family members. Um, I, I think the, this claim that these camps have uh, been closed require 
uh, careful scrutiny and using methods that we have been using, including satellite imagery and documentary res um, documentation research to look into this claim. But I think the secondly, you just mentioned that, um, well, some of these detainees have been moved to prisons as well. Um, I think even when I was researching and interviewing people about these camps in 2017, there was a fluidity of where people go, like they would be held in detention centers, which are formal facilities, and then they would be moved to political edu education camps, or some of the people in the camps were themselves coming from prisons, and vice versa. There was a bit of a movement. Um, I think there is, at the same time, during this Xinjiang crack this crackdown in the last few years, um, there is also um, an influx of prison numbers in Xinjiang. Um, the New York Times have documented that. So. Um, and also the use of mass surveillance, um, as we have also documented, uh, the uh, use of integrated joint operations platform, multiple checkpoints, mass surveillance, essentially uh, um, has locked down Xinjiang, which is the size of a third of Europe. Um, an incredible feat, if you if you would think about that, for an authoritarian country, um, to be able to essentially uh, calibrate people's ability to move around depending on how loyal um, they, uh, how, how, how much loyalty they show um, the government through technological means. So I would actually think that Xinjiang's problem is, uh, is uh, much greater than just the camps themselves, involving the use of forced labor, movement restrictions, mass surveillance, prisons, detention camp, uh, detention centers that are all of these, most of these problems persist, and the government is merely kind of arguing that some of these camps have been closed. Um, and I think the problem of Xinjiang has is a shifting shape because of the efficacy and the attention that is paid uh, to spotlight issues, thanks to uh, the work of, of those of, of people in this room. Uh, but they have not gone away. Um, and recently, uh, the Australia think tank uh, ASPI has just done this great report tracing how uh, Uyghur and Turkey Muslims are being shipped off to elsewhere in China as kind of cheap labor uh, to be rented uh, in uh, dozens of factories that, uh, sorry, in, in factories that supply dozens of, of brands, including those um, that are well-known name, names internationally. So let's open I'm going to take, wow, okay. Going to take three batches of three questions. Um, please keep it brief, and if you can, can you ascertain a member of the panel you would like to answer your question? So I'm going to take people who I don't think, I might get this wrong, haven't spoken so far. Gentleman in a blue jacket, a blue jumper first. Hi, uh, I'm David Stroop. I'm from the University of Manchester. Um, I think this is a really great uh, exploration of how um, this is not just about the implementation of surveillance technologies by authoritarian governments in places like Urumqi, but it's also uh, evident that there are, are roots in, in this uh, whole system in, in places like Palo Alto and London, right? Um, and so to that end, I would be curious, um, you know, uh, how any of you, I guess Darren and, and Nisha in particular, uh, thinking about how markets uh, might impact the other end, the in in the UK and the US, does concern for profit maybe have an impact on companies if they get outed as being, you know, complicit in this process? And you know, even collaborations in the academy when you talk to your colleagues in particular in STEM fields, you know, how do you get them to think about reputational costs about perhaps? being more circumspect about what their work is used for. You know, what what kinds of impact does that have in America, in the UK, and else, elsewhere? In other Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the Czech shirt, second row from the back. Yep. I, I think there's something really missing so far. Uh, beg your pardon. I feel there's something really missing so far, which is about why on earth are they bothering to do all this? And is it possible that the thing that's missing is corruption? The big companies must be marketing their, their surveillance products undercover by huge payments. It's a cheap way of doing it. Thank you. Question, I think, for Darren. OK. Uh, woman uh, next to the guy in the white T-shirt. Third, fourth row. Thank you. Um, uh, hi, I'm Catherine. I'm an, a master's student here at SOAS, and I'm really interested in how surveillance and technology is used on refugee and migrant flows. So maybe to Maya or to Darren, um, 
Can you talk about which are the biggest companies that are being employed in, in this kind of way for technology and what kind of aspects do you see tying back to the state for this? Thank you. So, um, uh, Darren, do you wanna, Darren, do you want to tackle the, the, the first question? Yeah, I'll try to answer quickly. Um, role of markets in pushing back or incentivizing this from David. Uh, the, I think probably it's more about incentives um, because like all of the big tech firms in the US at least, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, like they're competing against each other for market share and all of them are doing these kinds of things. Um, they need to be at the cutting edge of face recognition surveillance. I gave a talk at Google uh, about what's happening in Xinjiang and a lot of the questions I got from the audience was about the capacity. Like, how good are they at doing these things? And it, it had something to do with, you know, them thinking about, you know, where they're at, I think. That's how I felt um, the questions were fair. I mean, there was also many that were very concerned with the human rights aspects of these things, but um, there's certainly a com competition that pushes people to do these kinds of things. And so like Microsoft's ethics statement is that they'll do it if it's for a democracy. It's like a patriotic duty to help the US military. Um, and also now they're, they're working with AnyVision, which is in Palestine, um, which is also a democracy, they say. Israel's democracy, so it's okay. Um, so there's ways in which they frame these things that, that allow them to kind of justify them. And a lot of the ethics boards that most of these companies have um, are set up to kind of do that, to give permission to, to follow, follow through on these, tech, these technologies. I think if we, I mean, the, Microsoft is reviewing their relationship to AnyVision because NBC did a, a, an expose and, and really showed how the system works, um, where you can you know, plug in someone's name and find out where they are in real time. It's a system that's very similar to what's happening in Xinjiang. Um, moving on to the next question, uh, why are they doing this? Um, it's very complicated and it's hard to answer quickly, but basically the Uyghur homeland, Kazakh homeland in northwest China is, is the source of a great deal of natural resources. Uh, 20 to 25 percent of Chinese oil and natural gas are from this region. Uh, 84 percent of Chinese cotton, uh, 25 percent of the world's tomatoes are from this region. And so having control over this space, which is also framed as a key zone on the Belt and Road, is really important for the Chinese economy. Um, and so that's really what's motivating a lot of this. It's a it's a actually resource driven settler colonialism. Um, what's built out of that though is this surveillance system has become its own thing, has its own momentum, um, and it's a sort of an incubator space to build out these new kinds of technology, ex experiment with them, um, and find new markets for them. So now China Chinese tech firms are kind of framing what they're doing as as leading the world in counterterrorism. They're doing counterterrorism, counterinsurgency better than the West. Um, and so it's a competitive, com competitive advantage for them to be developing these, these kinds of tools. Um, there's also the labor aspect of this, or Uyghurs are seen as a source of cheap labor potentially. Um, and the tech is being used in the labor space as well. I mean, Amazon is doing this too, um, when you're tracking biometrics to make, people, make sure that people are efficient. They're doing some, they're not really looking at efficiency in quite the same way, um, but they're uh, making sure that, that people um, come to work on time, um, that they speak the language they're supposed to speak, they go through checkpoints, they have their phones checked three or four times a day. Um, there's lots of tech that's used in the, in the, in the um, factories as well. Thank, thank, thank you, Darren. Mm -hmm. uh, Rahima, can I direct that question about why are they bothering to you as well? How would you answer that question? Um, not, not I'm disagreeing with Darren, but I think it would be interesting to... Yeah, um, I would add, of course, um, I agree uh, with uh, Darren's answer. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, another motive, according to the uh, some of the uh, high-tech experts um, we interviewed, the, one of the motive is uh, using this technology to maximize uh, the arrest, to criminalize the people, the, the Uyghur people and other, other uh, Turkic uh, Muslims. Because uh, CCP sees Uyghurs all potential separatists. And uh, in order to arrest them, they need some kind of excuse.
So using this height uh, technology, uh, using the so-called um, joint integrated joint platform, the data is actually analyzed uh, after collected in this uh, data, uh, I will call it like reservoir, then it is analyzed and it was connected to the uh, public security uh, uh, bureaus. So the names uh, repeat, Every day, according to this uh, uh, high-tech expert, there are names will pop up uh, after the analysis of these people's movement. And uh, so there are the, the three different colors, yellow, green, uh, green, yellow, and red. So red is uh, dangerous, uh, yellow is suspicious, green is uh, normal. So no one can guarantee that uh, they, they are clean. Even this expert was detained for three months. He said, I knew how to avoid, I knew the technology so well, but somehow uh, uh, my uh, ID, uh, when, I, uh, when I swiped, when I, when I going through the checkpoint, it was yellow. And for that, they um, arrested me. One dangerous thing about this technology is that just very simple example, if you stayed in a hotel on the same night with someone who uh, served prison sentence in the past, your name automatically linked to that person. And that actually, and you don't know that that can happen, uh, how you can avoid that. And in that way, your, your ID became yellow, and then you became, you became suspicious. So the design of the technology, according to these experts, is actually they knew that this is very unfair. They can wrongly uh, accuse people being criminal or being dangerous, but that's what they need. They want to maximize the arrest. This is genocide. That's my, my, my answer. Thank you, Rahima. Maya, do you want to speak to the question on surveillance technology and migration? Br yeah. as, brief, yeah. as briefly as you can, please. Yeah, um, I would say that it's not very easy to just single out that the, the companies are involved in that. I haven't done enough research kind of globally to look at how um, surveillance is practiced on migrants. But I mean, some of the bigger names that I think people have just also, you know, discussed um, would be applicable for um, you know, I think, well, I, I don't know enough about the U.S. context and how they have been used on migrants. But, you know, in terms of facial recognition companies, there are only a few that are really big globally and expanding. Um, and, for example, NEC and SenseTime and MACV, um, voice recognition, iFlyTag, but, I mean, also, you know, Amazon. So I, I don't know enough specifically about migrants um, to, to say that. Uh, but I would also maybe... Um, also, I think there was a question about kind of the motivation. I think profits is definitely an, a very important one, but I think that in the context of China is social control. The government and the police is in a race to the bottom to figure out what's the best way uh, and to control people. And you see that uh, as far back as when the party came to power uh, decades ago. Um, and technology was was uh, thought to be a very promising um, arena. We've got three minutes left, so I'm going to take two questions. Sophia there and chap in the middle in the stripy shirt. That's you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia first. Sophia first. Oh. We've got Sophia in first. What problems does it cause to use that terminology? Obviously, I have a very loud voice. I didn't notice the microphone. <clears throat> so another, you, another question is, are we um, falling back onto this framing of the weak Uyghurs oppressed by the strong Chinese government? And isn't it rather more complex? And may I just abuse the position of the 
um, reader of the live stream to ask my own question, um, which is, um, isn't it the case that in the UK um, and in the US and maybe many of other contexts, we are accepting um, surveillance technology into our environments for reasons of convenience and even well-being. I'm extremely concerned about the extent to which surveillance is envisaged in our universities, where the privacy concerns can disappear because we're talking about improving our students' learning, supporting their well-being, um, avoiding suicides, and these are real projects that are going on um, that, that, that are of extreme concern. And if you um, look at a recent story, Sense Time, which is doing um, facial recognition technology in um, Xinjiang and has sold that to the um, Chinese government, is also marketing its technology to the UK higher education sector. And the UK minister was meeting with this um, company to talk about that. So uh, if any panelist wants to respond, that's more of a rant than a question. Thank you. A very important rant as well. Uh, gentlemen, as briefly as you can, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, what does the UK's uh, Modern Slavery Act, if anything, be able to strengthen on this front? And follow up on what may I mention about, you know, uh, prisons, uh, forced labor. We know that uh, big companies like Tesco uh, sources, uh, you know, uh, prison-made goods such as the Christmas cards recently, uh, in the, as reported, then they doesn't seem to have, you know, faced any consequences. And what does the UK consumer or consumerism in general place in enabling or resolving all these. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to, in, 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 in view of the time constraints, I'm going to allocate those questions. Um, uh, Nisha, could you uh, respond to the question around, uh, Sophia's question around the introduction of these technologies in higher education? Uh, Rahima, could you talk to the question of terminology and the, 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 the issue of, of Uyghur, in inverted commas, victimhood? Uh, and, and Darren, do you, are you confident with that last question? I, I am. <laughs> yeah, do you want me to go? <laughs> I kind of. I can answer, I'll answer part of it. You have a go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I'll, yeah. yeah. and I'll go and get lunch. Yeah. Okay, so let's go with Nisha first. So Nisha, Rahima, Darren. Uh, so, hello. Yeah, I, I um, agree, it's hugely problematic. I think actually one of the ways in which um, the positive aspects of surveillance one of the ways in which surveillance um receives kind of um hegemonic sort of consent is through the sale of it as a positive thing um in our social lives in all kinds of ways um it actually makes me think about um so obviously we have problems within the university and within um broader social settings in all kinds of ways, the way in which surveillance technologies are measuring kind of um, heartbeats, our health data, um, that, that will have all kinds of implications in the future, perhaps in terms of things like insurance, access to health and welfare services and so on. Um, but one of the things that occurs to me about the, the use of um, surveillance in these other domains that are seen as kind of positive things are that it is just about what was just said about it being around social control and, and and not just you know manipulating population so that we're not now in in democratic states trying to um gain consensus but actually trying to modify behavior um and this is what the positive surveillance technologies do right so they modify you know so in all kinds of subtle ways um you know, so it won't be long before we get requests. I was just saying, you know, in slightly different point, but for lecture capture, not for uh, reasons of being able to keep up with one's work, but for things like kind of public health. You know, so the the Kenora, uh, the uh, you know, the recent kind of health scares, and uh, are doing a lot for surveillance tech. Are doing a lot for promoting the idea that we need greater surveillance technologies in order to promote kind of non-contact social spaces. Um, so that's one way in which kind of um, you know 
our behaviors are modified or the social space gets changed. Um, and I think there's, that's, I, I mean, that's the kind of worrying thing about the way in which surveillance technologies are being uh, used or invoked is that it's changing, um, is, it's allowing kind of normalization of surveillance in all kinds of other ways. Thanks, Anisha. Darren, uh, change the order. Darren, could you address sure, that? Sure. So I can't really speak to the, the, the UK-specific anti-slavery laws or what have you, but in the U.S. context, I can. Um, it's very hard to prove this stuff because it's um, you just can't get access to these spaces or the, the companies, you know, they do an audit. Of, of a factory and when they show up, everything seems fine. The people tell them they're not forced to work. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, it, they're, they're very good at preparing for the inspection um, and also obfuscating what they're doing. So oftentimes these companies are subcontracting to other companies. So the, the actual contract is with a, a parent company in another part of China and they don't, they don't, in the initial context, they don't understand that the manufacturing is happening elsewhere. They don't know that Uyghurs are being forced to come in and work in their factory. Um, that's starting to change because there's more and more documentation. We're looking at it more closely, and so that means that uh, people are starting to be held accountable. But usually it's kind of a one-off sort of thing with a, a story coming out in the AP or something, and then they, you know, those products are taken off the shelf, and they said they didn't know, and they're sorry, basically. Um, so we need to actually have more of a concerted effort, and I think it's beginning to happen, um, especially around cotton, because so much cotton products are coming from this region. Um, the difficulty is that, that uh, many of these companies like Gap and H&M are very concerned that uh, they'll lose market share back in China because a lot of their sales are happening there. So it's not just, also the, it's not just their supply, but also the market. And so for them, it's a, it's a huge thing. Um, to take Chinese-made cotton products off the shelves completely. Um, that's, there's just a lot of power, a lot of money at stake, um, and that makes all of this difficult. And the companies, if we don't put pressure on them, will do nothing. So we have to continue to sustain the pressure, otherwise nothing will happen. Thanks, Darren. Rahima. So about East Turkestan, whether uh, is that the question? Uh, about a question around yeah, the other terminology we use, Xinjiang or East Turkestan, and also the question on from the live chat on 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 victimhood. If we're not, yeah, what, any feelings you have on that? Uh, it's actually a quite a difficult question, and this is being debated quite a lot. Uh, uh, whether we should continue to call East Turkestan or otherwise you uh, become victimized or being uh, labeled as a separatist. Um, but I think maybe China is maybe one of the, maybe the only country that victimize people for calling the name of the former uh, republic. And I think every Uyghur person uh, has the right to use the terminology that they want to use, East Turkestan. Of course, people are free to use uh, Xinjiang if they think that is a, a more appropriate uh, official um, title. But Xinjiang itself is, is, it, it says, it, the meaning is a new territory. So, um, <laughs> so that, that, that is my, my, my answer to that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. Uh, Maya, I hope you don't mind. Uh, we are really hungry here. Uh, and, and you're about to go off for a wonderful Hong Kong supper where we're probably having sandwiches. So, so I, I'd, I'd like to thank all the panel. Maya uh, over there in Hong Kong, Nisha, Darren and Rahima and for some fantastic presentations and great questions and contributions from you guys. Thanks very much.